today is Isaiah 60, verses 1 through 6, found on page 690 in your few Bibles. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will appear over you. Nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look around. They all gather together, they come to you. Your sons will come from far away, and your daughters shall be carried on their nurses' arms. Then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and rejoice, because the abundance of the sea shall be brought to you. The wealth of the nations shall come to you. A multitude of camels shall cover you. The young camels of Midian and Ephraim, and all those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and frankincense, and shall proclaim the praise of the Lord. The New Testament lesson is Matthew 2, verses 1 through 12, found on page 2 in the New Testament. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, asking, Where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophets. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word, so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure, treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. Let's pray. Lord, as we can gather around your word, we are, we are mindful that we live lives surrounded by many different voices. Voices speaking to us, voices speaking around us. But this morning, around your word, Lord, we pray that the only voice we would hear is yours. Speak to us through your scripture. Draw us closer to you. In Christ's name, amen. Well, here we are. It is over two weeks past Christmas. All the decorations have been taken down. There's no more nativity scenes here in the sanctuary or in the fellowship hall. All the baby Jesuses and the mangers, the shepherds, the Marys and the Josephs, the angels, the animals, and yes, even the wise men have all been boxed up and put away for another year. And yet, we're just now getting around to this passage of scripture from Matthew that tells us the story of the wise men and their journey to bring gifts and to worship Jesus. That's okay, we're just getting around to it. Because though we like to put the wise men in our nativity scenes and, and we sing about uh, we three kings around Christmas time, um, like we did this morning at the beginning of the service, I like that song too. I picked it out for this morning. But the truth is, 
We don't know exactly when they showed up. All Matthew says is that it was in the time of King Herod, and it was after Jesus was born, so um, they wouldn't have been there on that first Christmas day with the shepherds and all the others. In fact, it may have actually been up to two years after that first Christmas that the wise men showed up. And we don't know how many there were. It just says wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. The tradition of there being just three of them, it came from the fact that three different types of gifts are, are mentioned, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So the story came up that there were three of them, one with, one with each gift, but we don't know how many. The reality is, is that it was probably not so much these kind of three intrepid, solitary, rugged individual travelers on this journey to Jerusalem as it more likely it was a large caravan, a group of wise men, uh, along with their servants and maybe families and a whole host of animals carrying all their supplies. And this would have been actually a pretty impressive sight, this large group led by some pretty important wealthy people. They're important enough certainly to get an audience with King Herod when they show up. Um, not just anyone can go and get an audience with the king, but they do. And their news causes him some concern. So Herod calls together some of his people to help answer their, their questions about where exactly this new king was. The star, the star got the wise men as far as Jerusalem. But then it takes the chief priests and the scribes, it takes their, their knowledge of the scriptures to tell them that specifically that the Messiah was to be found in Bethlehem. And so on they go, with instructions from a nervous, maybe paranoid King Herod to let them know when they found this new king. The star shows up again, and it stops over the place where Jesus is. And they are overwhelmed with joy. So they enter. <laughs> They kneel down and they worship this child Jesus. And then they open up their treasure chest and they give him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Before they leave, God warns them in a dream not to go back to Herod, so they take another way back home. Now this story, this account of these visitors and these worshipers of Jesus from, from faraway lands, this story has captured the imagination of Christians throughout the centuries. So much so, that as I said, this passage, this, passage, this passage is the scripture for the celebration that ends the Christmas season each and every year, the, the day we call Epiphany. This passage has captured our attention so much that um, our imagination won't let these travelers remain anonymous, so we've decided somehow that there were three of them, and uh, even over time, names were given to them, assuming that there were only three. Names in a biography, we've attached that to them. Melchior, who is a wise man scholar from Persia, Caspar, a wise man scholar from India, and my favorite, Balthazar, a wise man scholar from Babylon. Even though Matthew never says how many there are, never gives any names, we can't seem to let them remain obscure and anonymous. Because this story, the first account that Matthew has of anyone being drawn and led to Jesus, it captures something that is fundamental to who Jesus is. It captures something that is essential to the gospel, the gospel message. And that is the concept of gifts. Gifts are undeserved. Gifts are surprising and unexpected. And gifts deserve a response. The gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, is that he is a gift for all people, not just the ones that we assume deserve it. <coughs> and in fact, even coming to Jesus, that is a gift. And we are called to respond, to offer up our gifts, and you might even say, to then re-gift 
what has been given to us. You know, probably the most striking thing about this story of these, these wise men is that they are not descendants of Abraham. They are not members of God's chosen people. These are unexpected recipients of God's gift, and yet, and yet it is they, and not King Herod, not the religious leaders who respond to God's call and leading to the Christ, to the Messiah. But it's these wise men, these people from far away. The first people that respond, for the first people responding and worshiping Christ that Matthew tells us about are strangers. They are, Matthew would have considered them pagans from pagan lands. They are people who don't look to the scriptures, but instead they look to astrology for truth. These are people who have, a, who have according to the religious notions of God's people, they've gone about things in all the wrong ways and maybe, they would maybe even call them sinful and idolatrous. But that's where God meets them. That's the people God draws and leads to Jesus. And God uses a heavenly sign, a star, to get them on the right road. He uses, he uses what they will notice, what they know, what they practice. He uses their practices, what, what might have been considered at best misguided um, by the religious leaders and at worst idolatrous. God uses those to get, to get them on their journey to Jesus. Now it doesn't end there. This only gets them so far by itself, but, but through this heavenly sign, God gets them to a place where he reveals himself more fully and more specifically. They are led to Jerusalem and to the chief priests and scribes who know the scriptures. And it's those scriptures, those words of God's specific self-revelation that get them to that personal and intimate meeting with Jesus. It's those scriptures that lead them to true knowledge of who God is and where they can find him. And the amazing thing here is that those who know those answers, those who have all their theological ducks in a row and they could win any Bible trivia contest hands down, they don't go anywhere. For all their right knowledge and theological orthodoxy, they are not moved at all. It's the ones that Matthew would probably say are the least deserving. With all the wrong and misguided theology, it's they that are moved. And they that have the proper response. And they follow God's call and God's leading. And they are the ones who are drawn closer to God. Because gifts, gifts are undeserved. Someone once gave me a gift out of nowhere, and in my response, I was raised right. I knew the proper, polite response was, oh, you didn't have to do that. And they looked at me. They said, I know I didn't have to. That's the whole point. Otherwise, it wouldn't have been a gift. In this story of these travelers and seekers from far away, we are reminded that fundamentally, Jesus and the grace he brings, it is a gift. He is a gift given to both those of us who know we don't deserve it. And thankfully, even, it is a gift given to even those of us who sometimes wrongly assume that we do. Grace is a gift because it is undeserved. Second, gifts are surprising and unexpected things, aren't they? One of the great joys of Christmas with a nine-year-old in the house is that we still have the opportunity to not just shop with his very specific and detailed list of every item and the model number and the right thing to get him. We actually, we actually still have a chance to go out, find something unexpected and surprising, find that, that perfect gift that he doesn't even know he wants. That thing he never expected, but it turns out to be the thing that he wanted so badly, and then to see that look of utter astonishment and surprise on Christmas morning. I don't often wish we had screens up in the sanctuary, but I wish we did now, because we got some pictures on Christmas morning. We did that. We had that gift. And the pictures of Ezra opening them, opening it up, he has this, this look of sheer surprise joy and then the final picture he is sitting like this staring at it <laughs> complete
completely unexpected and surprised. That is what gifts are. Matthew doesn't tell us exactly what the living situation was like for Mary, Joseph, and Jesus by the time the wise men arrived. They're in a house, but we don't know if they're still making do with strangers and animals or what, but you can sure they are not living any sort of affluent royal lifestyle. And so imagine how this scene would have looked and would have surprised the wise men. These men who have, they have a certain level of wealth and prestige and probably a level of assumptions about what a new king looks like. They're carrying treasure chests, after all. Imagine how they, they've embarked to go on this journey to visit a child who even the heavens have declared is a king. And they end up in Jerusalem, and that makes sense because that's the capital city, that's where the royalty would be, and they get an audience with the current king, and then they come to find out he's oblivious to the whole thing. And then they get pointed in the direction not of another big, powerful city, not to another royal family or a place of wealth or power or prestige or anything like that, but they get pointed to Bethlehem, tiny, little, insignificant Bethlehem. And then what they find is not a well-to-do or well-connected family, but a mother with her child. Joseph isn't mentioned. We don't know where he is right now. Um, but they're probably still making do in a stranger's house. Imagine their surprise at finding how humble this scene was compared with what they might have expected when they went to go visit a new king. None of the excitement and fanfare you would expect surrounding a royal birth. The gift of Jesus, the gift of God's grace, it so often shows up in the most unexpected and surprising of places. And like the best gifts, it's often not until after you've received it that you realize this is what I want, most wanted and most desired and most needed after all. Left to yourself, it may not be even what you would have picked out. But God's surprising and unexpected grace, it extends even to our clueless wanderings and our searchings. The wise men didn't know the route by themselves. They would have been lost if they had just set out. It was only because God showed up and led them by a sign that they made it to Jerusalem. And it was only because God had shown up and spoken through the scriptures over the centuries that they were led to Jesus. Gifts are unexpected and surprising things. Coming to Jesus it's an unexpected and surprising gift because on our own, we would never find the way. We would certainly never assume that the King of Kings, the Savior and the Lord of the universe would show up in a poor, homeless, helpless baby. But the good news is that God does not leave us to find the way on our own. Even faith, the faith that seeks and the faith that leads to the faith that sees and receives. All of that, that faith is a surprising and unexpected gift of God's grace to us. Finally, gifts deserve a response. We all know that you're supposed to write thank you, thank you cards when someone gives you a gift. How much more does this gift of the gospel, the gift God's grace in Jesus Christ, how much more does the, the, the most un undeserved and unexpected and surprising gift of all, how much more does that deserve a response? These wise men knew that. Their response was to bow down and worship and then to open up their treasure and offer Jesus gold, frankincense, and myrrh, to offer Jesus their treasure. And that family, that is our response as well. To give back to God out of the treasures that we have been given. To offer ourselves in the service of the gospel and the sharing of the good news. To respond to Jesus' gift of grace and mercy by regifting them. Regifting is okay, it's good. Regifting the grace and mercy that has been given to us, sharing it with others with our families, with our neighbors, with our friends, and yes, yes, even our enemies. Family, what a great reminder, this story of these travelers, this story of the undeserved, 
surprising and unexpected gift of God that is in Jesus Christ. What a great reminder this story is of our call to respond. To respond in faith and gratitude. To respond by offering back to God what He has given us. And to respond by not trying to hold this grace and mercy for just ourselves and just who we decide are the right people, but to share it, to give it freely to any and everyone, no matter how near or far they seem to us, no matter how deserving or not we judge them to be. What a great reminder this story is of our call to respond, to follow his leading, it's leading to himself and to kneel and worship Christ the King. So as we begin this new year, coming out of the season of Christmas, family, let us renew our commitment to receive this gift. Or maybe if you resonate more with, with the wise men at the beginning of their journey, seeking but not really sure who this Jesus is, this person that some seem so intent on calling Lord and Savior, if you're not really sure who he is, the wise men at the beginning of their journey, let this be the year maybe that you receive this gift for the first time. And then, then, family, let us respond. Let us be known as the most surprising and reckless of re-gifters this world has ever seen, sharing the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ in the most unexpected places, to those who seem the nearest and those who seem the furthest away. Let us re-gift recklessly, sharing the love of Christ in our service, sharing the mercy of Christ in our acts of care and concern, and sharing the grace of Christ in our words and our deeds to each other and to the world. Knowing, knowing that it is only by the undeserved, surprising, and unexpected gift of grace found in Jesus Christ that we have been led and called to join with the wise men from all those years ago kneeling before the greatest gift that this world has ever known. Family, will you join me this year in receiving and in re-gifting that gift to those near and far, to any and all who will hear? Let's pray. Lord, now in just this moment of stillness and quiet, Lord, speak to our hearts. Remind us again of the gift that you offer in Jesus Christ. Lord, show us where we need to receive that gift in our lives. Show us where and how we need to respond. Lord, guide us and lead us as you did those wise men all those centuries ago. Guide us and lead us to you, King of kings and Lord of lords. Let us receive his gift to us. Amen. Amen.